So uh, first of all, we we like to would like to thank the organizers for of the workshop for inviting us to communicate today about the research we carried out uh, together, Mewin, Ajaj, and I, on uh, cancer clinical trials. So uh, in this talk, we are going to share the floor uh, to focus on the issue of replicability in the uh, clinical research. The interest of uh, this object is that it allows uh, to call into question the notion of replicability in its practical dimension, namely as the pathway between the experimental area of research and the medical area of the clinic. So one thing. Uh, Sorry, can you just go full screen for with your PowerPoint, if you can? Yeah, I I'm I am full screen, so I don't know. Okay, so just Hi. go up. Yeah. So sorry. Um, so one thing is to be able to validate uh, scientific knowledge uh, by replicating experiments under given laboratory conditions. So what we could uh, call internal validity, and another is to verify them by confronting them with reality. So external validity. From this point of view, clinical research offers, as we uh, think, an original point of view on what uh, we call the crisis of replicability. So in this paper, we will uh, consider the notion of replicability as the ability to replicate therapeutic protocols based on clinical trials in ordinary clinical practice. From uh, this perspective, the, no the question of replicability refers to the problem of transition between research and care, uh, the experimental and the medical, and scientific knowledge to uh, clinical practice. To do this, we will draw on the results of uh, research we conducted on the inclusion of elderly cancer patients in clinical research in France. So in this research, we investigated the conditions and the experiences of inclusion of elderly cancer subjects in uh, clinical trials uh, in five uh, hospitals in the Paris area between 2017 and 2020. We conducted 13 interviews with medical oncologists and geriatricians um, who are, were involved in clinical research as members of oncogeriatric uh, coordination units and 25 interviews with elderly cancer patients and their oncologists, eight, and clinical research technicians, six. So as, uh, uh, as we shall see, uh, this study shows that the guidelines resulting from therapeutic research in oncology are difficult to replicate in the older patient population, which calls into question the practice of evidence-based medicine. First, uh, we will therefore go back to the paradox concerning the population of patients, which is both the most numerous and the least included in clinical trials. And then um, uh, Mewin will take, uh, we, we will analyze the problems posed by uh, the situation for clinicians in the practice of evidence-based medicine. Mewin, peut-être que... Tu, tu changes les slides. <coughs> Sorry, are you not seeing the slides when I change them? No, I don't see it. See it. Sorry. If um, I may, perhaps you are sharing the wrong screen you're sharing the wrong window you're sharing the there's there are two presentation there are two powerpoint windows one okay. is where the ah is that better yes ah sorry okay. everyone this is uh, i'm not uh, new to zoom okay next please <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> thank you so um to begin with uh, one should remember that clinical trials are medical scientific uh, devices primarily intended to assess the medical values of potential treatments. So they are generally carried out over a given period of time by a pool of investigating physicians assisted by their teams. Uh, 
often spread over several distinct medical centers that are re required to follow an identical experimental pro protocol defined, defined by the institution that organizes and finances uh, the trials, uh, namely the sponsors. So, as uh, the historian Harry Marx clearly shows in the history of uh, clinical trials, one of the challenges of this uh, therapeutic evaluation tools quickly became the recruitment of sufficiently large and medically, medically homogeneous uh, patient populations in the different clinical uh, research centers. The statistical power, as well as the biological relevance of the trials, results are directly related to the selection of subjects since the aim is to measure a difference between groups that should be attributable as much as possible to the potential treatment and not to other factors such as uh, individual differences. As Stephen Epstein shows in his book, Inclusion, the Politics of Difference in Clinical Research, the history of uh, clinical research has led to the progressive exclusion of some populations from uh, clinical trials. Among them, women, children, members of the ethnic minorities, but also the, the elderly. From the 80s, it became increasingly obvious that the ma vast majority of clinical trials in the world were conducted on a typical uh, subjects, namely the middle-aged white male uh, from the middle class. The reason for this was the increasingly strict supervision of medical research, which had become more and more stringent as scandals linked to the experiment on orphans, Afro-Americans, or the elderly, justifying that this population should be specially protected. As a consequence, clinical, trial, uh, cl clinical research has, for a long time, uh, developed on the premise of the biological universality of the human being, to use the expression of Margaret Locke and Vintim and Vigen. According to this premise, the results of experiments on the body of one type of human being could be replicated on the body of any human being, regardless of gender, ethnic origin, age, or anything else. Consequently, it uh, would be legitimate to, apply, uh, to apply to a whole population of patients, protocols established on a sample of this population. Regarding cancer patients, this uh, research policy has led to an eminently paradoxical situation. In Europe and uh, the United States, the, ma the majority of cancer occurs after the age of 65. In France, 45% of cancer diagnosed in 2012 were after 70 years old. In this context, the median age at diagnosis was 72 years old. And oncologists uh, consider that a patient to be old from uh, 60 to 75 years of age. Despite cancer particularly affects the elderly, they seem paradoxically sparsely included in the clinical trials. Numerous studies and uh, systematic reviews shows the underrepresentation of older patients in cancer clinical trials. For example, patients of 75 years and more are less than 10% of included patients in phase two or three clinical trials in the US National Cancer Institute from, uh, since uh, 2001, whereas they represent more than 30% of new cancer cases. In France, the, the, the situation is quite similar. And as one oncologist who met during our fieldwork told us, it's obvious that the, there is an underrepresentation of elderly cancer patients. Namely, we are around 10%, whereas in the population for most cancer, it's around 40 or 50%. So in this context, one may wonder if data obtained in what, we, what is called young patients, who are mostly included in clinical trials, can be transferred to older people. That is uh, a question posed by many professionals who met during our field work. And so I, I will now leave the floor to Mewin Ajej, uh, who will expose this.
Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so based on the interviews that we conducted with oncologists and geriatricians during the social sociological studies, uh, Gironcosage and Calissage, uh, on the practices of inclusion of older patients in clinical trials. Um, we'll now highlight the translation difficulties that these professionals face in their everyday practice. Um, in both studies, oncologists and geriatricians agreed um, that data on the specific category of patient is lacking and that much of the available data is not applicable to their patients. So uh, we talked to Dr. P, who has been a geriatrician for over 25 years, um, and she was the driving force in the implementation of um, co uh, coordination units in oncogeriatrics, which um, we, have, uh, um, we have here in France. So for her, uh, older patients are a specific population, and they require ad hoc data and trials. And during our interview with her, um, this is what she said. We often assume that what has been validated in adults in terms of treatment and therefore efficacy and toxicity is the same for all adults. We know that this is not true. So oncologists and geriatricians also agree that clinical trials are conducted on populations that don't sufficiently share the characteristics of their patients. Um, and beyond the age difference, people included in clinical trials are often healthier than the patients that they see every day in them in their clinical practice. Um, as one oncologist put it, the patients included in these studies are PS0 or PS1 patients. So this is performance status one, performance status two, and it's a measure of the patient's good general health. Uh, so the patients included in these studies are PS0, PS1 patients without any major comorbidity. Um, in other words, they don't have any other major disease. Um, in other words, they are absolutely not representative of the older population that we see in oncogeriatrics. So we definitely need to have trials that are specific to older subjects, the ones we see in real life, so we can better understand what factors will be associated with whether or not a treatment is carried out, or what risk factors will be risk factors for toxicity for certain treatments. So connecting uh, with what physicians call real life is a major activity and concern in the everyday practice of clinicians. Um, <clears throat> however, very few studies specific to older subjects exist. And in the absence of sufficient evidence-based medical data, clinicians are left to their own devices. The oncologists uh, we interviewed describe situations in which they have to make clinical decisions about older patients with multiple diseases based on studies conducted uh, in populations that are sometimes quite different from their patients. So Dr. Z is an oncologist that we met uh, who specializes in oncogeriatrics and in his interview he told us this. Those people that we're going to treat who are fragile, nobody knows how to do it to be honest. The question is, how do we treat them? Do we do chemotherapy with adapted doses? Okay, but adapted according to what? Adapting the doses, it can't be us just eyeballing it. It can't be, let's just give 30% less to everyone. Strictly speaking, we should adapt according to pharmacological criteria. We should look at albuminemia. This is the protein level in the blood and it indicates um, whether the liver is functioning, the, sorry, the liver is functioning well. Um, we should have a sense of clearance of liver function. Um, unfortunately, it's rarely done. And among other things, this is because there are very few pharmacology studies on older subjects. Um, and these, <clears throat> uh, these are old drugs that no one cares too much about. So adjusting the dosage is sometimes very empirical, not to say irrational. And the tendency is generally, curiously enough, uh, the tendency is to underdose. We could do chemo, or maybe we shouldn't do chemo, or maybe just very light chemo. I'm not sure chemo makes sense for all patients, but in practice, we do it. So oncologists such as Dr. Z say they lack data to guide them in adapting treatment doses, uh, particularly according to the state of the liver. Without this data, without evidence-based medical data, they rely on their experience to make approximations, um, what some have called the art of the clinic, or what some cynics have even gone so far to call eminence-based medicine, um, because it would only rely on the opinion or the social status of the doctor. Um, that being said, 
uh, oncologists can call on geriatricians to assist them in this process of adapting treatments uh, that are originally designed and tested on healthier or younger patients. The geriatrician assesses the patient, identifies the various characteristics of his or her frailty, and provides the oncologist with advice on whether or not to adapt the treatment. For Dr. Z, the evaluation is valuable, um, but it doesn't entirely solve the problem of adjusting the dosages. Um, so he goes on to say, the thing is, once the geriatricians have done a solid evaluation and they tell us adapt the treatment, we aren't much better off because we don't know exactly how to adapt. It's basically guesstimating. The geriatricians can't help because they know even less than we do because it's not their field of expertise. There's no geriatrician who has the knowledge of chemotherapy. So, and there's no well-constructed pharmacological discussion about the older subject, and that's a real problem. So working in the gap between scientific data and the clinic uh, requires relying on external expertise in geriatrics, for example, but this doesn't erase the daily translation work of oncologists. Um, I'd like to nuance this by saying that one of the particular, the, the, sorry, one of the peculiarities of caring for older patients is the heterogeneity of the patient population. In other words, older patients are very different from one another, more so than younger patients. For example, they have a greater diversity of other pathologies with different degrees of autonomy and disabilities. Clinicians must therefore often adapt standards and recommendations to the specific situation of their patients. A geriatrician, Dr. C, tells us standards must be defined. We must have evidence-based medicine, that's for sure, but because despite everything, it would allow us to better adapt medicine on a case-by-case -case basis. But inevitably, oncogeriatrics remains a highly personalized medicine, I think, because no two patients are the same by essence. The older population is a heterogeneous population with patients who at 80 years old run marathons and others at 72 years old who are suffering from heart attack, failure, uh, heart failure, history of stroke, early Alzheimer's, diabetes, hypertension, and kidney failure. Um, so more so than, more so with their older patients, uh, oncologists have to work in a gap between practice guided by medical data produced in trials and or evidence-based medicine and what they call real life with older subjects who don't correspond to the standard individual. Um, I'd like to take a second and highlight the difference that's implicitly made here between uh, the notion of older subject and frail subject. Um, practitioners say that the translation problems are greater for frail patients with multiple pathologies and disabilities. Um, a geriatrician told us about an old patient um, who he was asked to evaluate because of his age uh, to assess his level of risk if he were to have surgery. So he told us, I remember an 82-year-old patient diagnosed with stom uh, stomach cancer. He was referred to me for an evaluation to see if his stomach should be removed. This guy, I did the evaluation. He tells me he plays tennis with his grandson who's ranked. He, they played two matches per week minimum. And the operation is this way, sir. Thank you. No history, no treatment, just go in for surgery. This guy, he didn't need to see me. Uh, so while the notion of the older, older is more frequently used in the conversation, the um, interviews show that for clinical decision making, civil age is actually less of a concern than biological age. So We'd like to conclude by saying that looking at replicability in the light of the space between the experimental realm on the one hand and real life on the other hand, um, leads to questioning the imperative of replicability that we know underlies the process of validating scientific knowledge. With the case of clinical research, what the case of clinical research in cancerology shows is that um, there, the statistical principle underlying the production of evidence, the all other things being equal, this doesn't guarantee the replicability of validated treatments in the general population of older cancer patients. The fieldwork and the interviews that we carried out um, lead us to question the relevance of the hierarchy of levels of evidence accepted in the paradigm of evidence-based medicine. As we know, this paradigm places randomized clinical trials at the top. 
And while these trials are designed to be replicable in multiple research centers, which is their strength from a scientific standpoint, they may reveal their weakness uh, when clinicians seek to apply the protocols in the clinic. This is why we come to question if the production of medical knowledge concerning the population of geriatric subjects should solely hinge on the standards of evidence-based medicine as we know them. So this leaves us with two further questions. Does the production of medical knowledge concerning the population of older subjects necessarily hinge on randomized clinical trials? Given, and second question, given that today, randomized controlled clinical trials are seen as the gold standard, shouldn't we rethink the way we reason and consider evidence concerning older patients? Thanks. <laughs>